Hello, you're listening to Work, Learning, and Social Change, Foundational Voices, an informal discussion with some of the figures who have helped to define the field. In this episode, we hear from Jean Lave, Professor Emeritus of the University of California, Berkeley. Filmed at the University of Toronto in the spring of 2024, in this conference keynote presentation, she discusses themes of learning, dialectics, and subjectivity with Professor Peter Sajak. Good evening, everyone. Hello. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and for bearing with some technical figuring out. Um, we are so excited on behalf of the Graduate Student Research Conference to host and feature such an incredible talk tonight from the Center for Learning, Social Economy and Work. Thank you so much for joining us. It is my honor. It is my honor to introduce Dr. Michael Bernhardt, who is joining us from the University of Frankfurt. He studies adult education and multilingualism, and it's very exciting. Um, so without further ado, because I know who you're all here for, I will pass it over to Dr. Bernhardt, who will do the other introductions. Thank you for the kind introduction. I'm delighted to be here and chair tonight's conversation between Jean Leif and Peter Zorchuk on learning dialectics and subjectivity. To start, I would like to, on behalf of Jean, Peter, and me, thank the Graduate Students Association for organizing this conference. <laughs> and also thank Clouseau for sponsoring this event. <laughs> and last but not least, uh, thank Oisey for hosting Jean, myself, and Christiana Hof uh, over the last couple of days, which enabled us to engage in a series of conversations that I'll briefly contextualize. So before I introduce Jean and Peter, I would like to say a few words on what brings me here to OISI and how tonight's conversation came about. So I work in the Department of Adult and Further Education at the Goethe University of Frankfurt, chaired by Christiane Hof. And our research focuses on questions of adult learning, particularly outside of educational institutions. So that means we investigate learning, for instance, during life course transitions, in the context of work, and in migration. So seeing learning not as merely a reaction to teaching, we assume that learning takes different shapes and occurs in specific configurations and opportunity spaces. So this leads us to view learning as a relation between different actors, between reflection, engaging with experiences and practices, and the arrangements that shape this engagement. So to further develop this understanding of learning, we hosted last fall a conference and brought together an international group of researchers to discuss adult learning outside educational institutions. And so of particular interest were the interrelations of life course, including life course transitions and biographical experience, and the evolving role of work in people's lives. We were very fortunate to have Jean and Peter among the presenters, and we all enjoyed very enriching conversations, both as part of the official conference and in the liminal spaces throughout and after the sessions. And I would suggest that tonight's conversation between Jean and Peter is a continuation of the exchange that began in Frankfurt, where they both first met and connected on shared research interests. And so my being here in Toronto is also related to the edited collection of works so of the book that is emerging out of the conference that we tentatively call Adult Learning at the Nexus of Life Course, Work and Transitions. So this book is being co-edited by myself, Christiane Hof, Peter Zorchuk, Stephen Billet, Katrin Kraus, and Victoria Masik, and will be published in the next year or so. One of the chapters is dedicated to Jean's perspectives on learning and its political, historical situatedness. To jointly develop this chapter in a creatively unfolding way, Christiane and I have had very engaging conversations with Jean over the past few days here at OISI. Having thus led the stage, it's now my great pleasure to introduce Peter and Jean. Peter Zorchuk is Professor of Adult Education in the Department of Leadership, Higher and Adult Education here at OISI, where he teaches and publishes in the area of work and learning studies. 
He's a co-founder and former director of OISI's Center for Studies and Learning, Social Economy and Work, which is, as I said, helping sponsor this evening's event. Peter's career has been characterized by a deep commitment to understanding the complex intersection of education, work, and social change. And he is described on Rate My Prof as, I quote, one of the most inspirational professors you will ever encounter at the University of Toronto. <laughs> Take that. <laughs> Peter has published 11 books over his career. Among them are Adult Learning and Technology in Working Class Life, Critical Perspectives on Activity, Exploration Across Education, Work, and the Everyday, and Contested Learning and Welfare Work, each of which speak to his specialization in studies of occupations and everyday life at work as a matter of mind and political economy. These books, not entirely coincidentally, all appear in Cambridge's University's Press Learning and Doing book series. A book series that was in many ways launched with the help of Jean Leif and Etienne Wenger's path-breaking publication on situated learning. But there's not only this connection between Jean and um, Peter, but among Peter's many community engagement roles, he served as an academic committee member for the United Needle Trades Industrial and Textile Employees Union. And those who read Jean's work will know Apprentices and masters in the needle trade feature prominently in her research. So I'll come to introducing Jean. Jean Leif is Professor Emerita at the University of California, Berkeley, where she researched and taught in education, geography, and anthropology. She taught at the UC, Ber UC Irvine, Irvine for 20 years and UC Berkeley for another 20. She carried out ethnographic fieldwork in central Brazil in the 60s and later in Liberia, Southern California, and Portugal. She holds honorary doctorates from Aarhus University in Denmark and the University of St. Andrews, Scotland, and has received a Lifetime Achievement Award from the American Society for Psych Psychological Anthropology. Jean is a social anthropologist and critical theorist with a strong interest in ethnographically based research to understand learning, learners, and everyday life in terms of social practice. Her pioneering research in situated learning, communities of practice, and the role of apprenticeship has greatly impacted our field for decades, leading to a better understanding of learning as changing participation in changing practices. Many of you will know her seminal book with Etienne Wenger, Situated Learning, Legitimate Peripheral Participation. Her other works, though perhaps lesser known, are also profoundly insightful. In Apprenticeship and Critical Ethnographic Practice, she interweaves an analysis of the process of apprenticeship among the tailors of Liberia, with reflections on the evolution of her research on those tailors. And in doing so, she challenged her own and conventional assumptions, rethinking and redoing her work, and thus becoming an apprentice to her own changing practice. In cognition and practice, Jean challenged traditional views of intelligence and expertise, highlighting the situated and social nature of cognition. By studying everyday activities, particularly those involving mathematics, Jean shows how creative novelty does not spring from cognitive processes, but from dialectical relations between the experience lived in world and its constitutive order. In one of her more recent, recent works, Learning an Everyday Life, Jean elaborates on her shift towards understanding the dialectical, material, historical, and political relations that compose the process of moving through and participating in practice. This interest in dialectical thought in empirical studies of learning is what brings Jean and Peter together today. They will explore learning, dialectics, and subjectivity in a format that demonstrates the dialogically unfolding and creatively messy process of pursuing intellectual interest and questions that matter. They will engage in a fireside chat, even without a fireplace. <laughs> For about next five, 45 minutes, so we'll have about 45 minutes, after which there will be time for discussion. So take good note, think of questions, and without further ado, I give it over to you, Tina and Peter. Please join me in welcoming Tina and Peter. to start, and what I want to begin with is to 
sort of address the question which I imagine is in all of your minds, which is, what are we doing having a conversation together about these issues without knowing exactly what's going to happen and without giving formal talks about it and so on? Um, uh, and and, and whether, I think there are reasons for this. And I wanted to share those reasons before we started talking about the particular issues. Um, first of all, uh, uh, since that conference in Frankfurt, uh, and, uh, uh, Peter and I have had a number of conversations on Zoom and read some of each other's work and discovered with real excitement that we share a, a lot of similar views about the theoretical uh, work that, that we take very seriously and that informs our work. We also share a, a, a commitment to doing empirical, for me, ethnographic work, and that's something we can discuss more about if we get there. Um, uh, but but for, for people who really like to think about social theory, one of the things that I admire and, in, and have in, enjoyed or come to trust in the way that we think about work is that we both take our commitment to doing empirical research as the wellspring from which uh, our interests, our pursuit, our search for seriously uh, a productive social theory comes from that place, not from some abstract, you know, whatever. So given that we, so one of the reasons, uh, um, oh, and there's one more piece to this <coughs> discovery of common, common uh, approaches to the work we do, and that we've discovered that the way we got to where we are today, I didn't think dialectically when I started out, and it's a long struggle and one that's evolving and hopefully goes on getting deeper over many more years, um, and neither did Peter. And so one of the things that we have shared is the sense of, uh, of interest in the question, how have we gotten to this quite similar place in our research over years uh, of, of work? Um, and, and there was no cheating. We never talked to each other before. <laughs> um, uh, so there's a shared kind of intellectual trajectory as well as the other things that we share. At the same time, we have arrived at these very similar positions through many of the same routes, but nonetheless, we are also different from each other in what mattered about the things we pursued theoretically and empirically. And uh, 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 so I want to know how Peter has done, has used and developed things I thought of as important resources differently than, than I have. And so that's one of the reasons to have a serious conversation together rather than um, you know some uh, single formal talk or something. So that's one reason for uh, have trying this sort of experiment in having a conversation in, in public, <laughs> you know, a uh, very scary thing to do, but um, the second reason, I think, for trying to do this to, today is that um, uh, given what I just told you about the sense of there's been a long process for each of us, uh, a long and rather similar process of, of arriving at kind of where we are now and the way we think about what the work we do, uh, 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 I think there's, I think it's important to think about your own working lives 
research trajectories, what you'd like to do by way of empirical studies in the world of the, of, of and coming to make and change the way you work over time of really allowing yourselves, insisting to yourselves on thinking about the long 20 years, 30 years that you have to in, engage in the kind of work you're doing. And I don't think we talked to students, and as it took me a long time after I started teaching, to say, wait a minute, how what I, uh, how, how is what I imagine doing next coming out of what I've done before, connecting to it, and where do I want it to go in the long run? And so uh, we can't help discussing that today, and I, I want, it's something that I hope we give you as a, something to consider in your own lives. And the third reason is just that I think academic life these days squeezes out and makes far too little time for just passionate, fun, interesting, intellectual conversation. And so uh, I, I hope if we do what we're hoping will come of this, we offer it as an example. <laughs> So that's that's what I have to say. What do you think, Peter? I don't know. That's not how I understood what we were going to do. <laughs> Darn. No, it, it is. And you, you did a good summary. Don't you? When you find a good intellectual partners, uh, and, and this was very much inspired by, in a different way, by the ideas that kind of like Homer and Pigeons brought us to Frankfurt, because we came for different, we kind of, uh, in our busy work, came for different reasons. And that title even that Michael um, laid out for you from the forthcoming book, uh, he and Christiana and others are bringing together, it was like, I said, I can't, I don't have time to do this. And then I did it anyways, and you said, I, I don't, I don't not do this. <laughs> and then we both said, and a whole bunch of other people, all of those, all said, and we all came. So that's the magic of Michael and Christiana. Yeah, you guys did it. But um, yeah, and then and my <coughs> sister, we kind of just uh, had a good intellectual life. We kind of, uh, it was kind of, um, my partner listens to us on Zoom for like an hour and a half, two hours at a time, saying, what are you laughing so much about? Anyways, down there. Uh, so anyways, to get on to, 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 the, to the thing here today, we kind of uh, talked about uh, the question of, of our shared interests in dialectics. We found we both were kind of passionate readers and re-readers of the work of the American philosopher Bertolt Bollmann. And we're both kind of, in a way, applied students. You just correct me. Yeah, no, no. I, that's a great But a kind of applied students, I had a phrase, I don't think it's a good phrase, but I said we kind of, how I would understand is I increasingly lasso in and try on more of his um, approach. And not a lot of people turn dialectics into applied social science and bring them together in a real yeah. way. And so I think there might be books there someday. But um, uh, so one of the ways we thought we'd do it is we'd give real empirical examples of what we thought we learned, but what also troubled us about, um, and just like with any of your research project, you learn something that's a value. But it also, if you're really, uh, got your face into this thing, you also start finding, you know, also I get a little bit of a, of a worry. You go, wow, there's something more here. And we get a little disconcerted. And there's a new puzzle in front of us. And it's like if you finish a research project, I think, and you don't end with a puzzle, a problem, or a sense of disconcertment, then work hard. Uh, maybe. Uh, anyway, so we're going to, I'm going to do a quick summary. I want to hear more about your, a, a piece of your early work. This is my agenda. I know we weren't supposed to have agendas. My agenda is, I want to hear an example of your early okay. empirical work, some insights, some things that you, you brought to the, to the forefront through that. But most importantly, what, what thing you've started to learn over time that you need to or want to do more with. And just to get you going, I'll say one little thing. My first major research project was just a pretty simple qualitative project. We interviewed about 120 uh, 
manufacturing workers. And we wanted to do a thing, which I didn't know the implications of at the time. I wanted to do a thing called a learning life history interview. What was their life? Uh, and we naturally <coughs> talked about work a lot, because that was kind of the fun to focus of the work, but their learning experiences and so on and so forth. I came in with almost, wow, well, not much theory yeah. on learning. I had read Sweet and Jean and a few other people, but I said, I'm gonna go out and go into these homes, go into these communities, go into these workplaces, not a trained ethnographer by any means, but you can learn a, a lot, even without some of the trappings of the training. And uh, I felt I landed on some insights about, Jean's my kid at me, about this, the idea of that mind was a thoroughly social and political economic entity that we experience it as individuals, but according to the condition, the mind can be bigger than that and must be also considered bigger than that in the electrical sense. But my only concern, my initial kind of work with dialectics was what are the contradictions of capitalism in the life, culture, and mind of these groups, these individuals, so on and so forth. So that was the insight. What I did, what I found, what troubled me in my belly was, and this is, now it's going to be over to you, was that I didn't have the details of how um, these communities functioned, how these workplaces function, and really, I was pretty ham-fisted with the idea of how the political kind of capitalism function, as in, and, and is in the mind, life, uh, and life course of these people. So I knew I was missing something, but only after that. But now, your early, your early empirical experiences, insights, and then something that <laughs> said, hmm. Oh, okay, I, I should say, I okay? think you were, oh, okay. I thought you were, I, 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 I think Peter was much earlier into uh, 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 reading, probably reading Ullman and bringing some kind of dialectical sensibility to his early work. Not, uh, well, compared to you? Yeah, compared to me, I didn't have it. And I, I you know, when you were talking about, you, you were thinking about situated learning the other day, and you said, you know, the word dialectical appears like <laughs> three times or something. In, in the book. In the, the book. Beautiful, well, depending on what issue you have, the one I have right now is pretty early, so it's yellow, but whatever. The good yellow one. I handed out so many of those copies to students. I've given you a lot of royalties. <laughs> um, uh, but anyways, I have one that's not dog here at all because it's one of my leftovers of giving away. But yes, so I did what any good great researcher does. I did a word search in electronic version of that book. I said, does the word dialectum variation or dialectum appear? And it does appear. And I wrote an article about this, which I don't think you've ever read. Something's gone here. And it was a, a, and I said, I said, there's a, there's a dialectical shadow in all of this, and it's, but it's only mentioned at two, I think two, maybe three spots. And I said, but I think in terms of the construction of a text, it's mentioned at very important parts of the text. So you don't have to read that article when I document it. I'd be so glad to know what I was doing. <laughs> and and I, the other thing you said, which I thought was really funny, is you said, do you think you understood what dialectical uh, theory was about when you did use the term in situated learning? I don't know. I, there was doubt in his voice. And there's, <laughs> you, there, I, I shouldn't attribute anything to Peter, uh, but there was sure doubt in mine. It was like, it was, I was barely trying to understand what it meant to, to talk about something as dialectical at all, and I was very unsure of what I was doing, and indeed it was just like, I feel encouraged by the fact that he says it appeared at points that mattered in the text. That seems like a, a, a hopeful sign. For <laughs> well, that was my contention. <laughs> well, it's very generous, I suspect. <laughs> Who knows? But I like the idea, I have to say. I think it's cool. I think when, when you're out, well, correct me if you think, but I think when you really have your fingers in the project, um, it doesn't matter quite as much that you have a didactic command of terminologies I think it matters think that you could go and stand up and say the words and you know make kind of sense. But there's something magical about the application, and if you get some of it right, it means a lot. Uh, that's that would be my way out. Absolutely, I agree. Yeah. I, yeah. 
All right, so at some point, I want to come back to uh, Ullman, because I think one of the interesting things that, uh, about how each of us works is that Ullman has been central for both of us. But when I say, well, here's what it is about Ullman that really has shaped the way I do research, <laughs> Peter says, well, that didn't have any effect on him. And then he tells me what about Ullman really got to him. And I said, I never paid any attention to that part she of didn't, Ullman. She didn't pay attention to his book about alienation. I, I did, but not to the extensions part, you know, the part that got to me. So maybe that would be something to come back to, maybe, if we want to. Yes, yeah, sir. Sure. I'll do, uh, so let's see, the Ullman thing. Oh, mind. We need to have a fight about the way he used the concept of mind. Yeah. But we could do that later, and it's not as important as some other We can. Things. I tell you, I've kind of thought about it. I don't have an answer. But we've had this discussion like five times. And I don't really, I, I'm getting a better answer to it, but it's still not satisfactory, because this is there's really just a lot of pragmatics. Yeah. Do you want to do it now? Sure, if you want. But you say practice, and I say mind. Yeah. <laughs> is that what I mean? <laughs> Uh, in a theory of, uh, what are we saying? I, Learning, mind, and, and, and I think it will get us to the notion of subject and person eventually, but that's the end, uh, only if we can't avoid it. <laughs> that's another funny thing, though, we got to get to, which is the idea okay. of discovering some interest in this. What? You want to just... No, it's not ready for that. Okay, all right. I have a plan. So, uh, okay. Uh, anyway, so... So I'll give my example. Yeah, you can give your example. That's the best thing. All right, you guys, this is very important. Um, uh, uh, I'm not even sure we use the term disconcertment in precisely the same way, but it, uh, it, it doesn't. But maybe we do. So maybe you'll know when I get done saying how I'm using it for you. Um, I got to thinking about how to tell you about, uh, you know, five years of ethnographic research off and on in Liberia, and another 30 years of writing about it, and things happening, and I thought, how can I do that in five minutes? And it, it, it's a little challenging. And so I thought, the thing to do is to tell you the story of some particular moments in that project that were s totally significant in blowing out where I was the day before, <laughs> or the minute before, and changed the, the way I understand what it was that mattered about what I was doing. And uh, Maybe just to say something about ethnographic research, um, well, any research. I, I think you're uh, encouraged by, the, at least in the States, to uh, uh, you apply for research grants from the National Science Foundation. And I, I, I would caricature those applications as, please list the questions you are going to ask, tell us how you are going to investigate them, and what the conclusions are going to be. Do you really want to spend your life doing research in which you already know the answer before you begin? Why bother, right? Um, and so I think really serious, no, I think I won't say what I was just about to say, about <laughs> what you, how you get around that problem, but you need to get around it because what you should hope for in the course of any research you're doing or uh, is to be brought face to face with something you didn't expect to happen and that calls into question everything you had thought about the issue or the, you know, up to that point and makes you stop and regroup and rethink and redo what you were doing. So uh, it also makes for a good story, a way to tell a story, and I thought I would tell you three of those points in the light with respect to the Nigerian research that I did. You, do you all know I did all this 
research on, on the uh, craft apprenticeship among Vi Angola tailors in Monrovia in, Latin, uh, uh, in the 70s. Right. Um, and I've written, I've written about both of them, so you'll have to forgive me if you, if these stories aren't totally surprising, it's possible you've heard them before or read them, but um, uh, what the first trip, I'm going to talk about the first trip I made and the last sort of uh, work I did on the project some years later. The first trip I made to Liberia to do field work, I just was there for three weeks. Um, I'd been challenged to go by my colleague Michael Cole. I had I hadn't thought about it at all. He said he he said you think you know he was writing a book on culture and cognition, and I read it and said I don't think you take culture seriously enough. And he said if you're serious, uh, you ought to be able to do it better. Here's here's a ticket. Why don't you go to Liberia? So I went and I spent. Um, just three weeks, and I decided that uh, if uh, uh, for there were various strategic reasons why looking at craft apprenticeship in West Africa looked like a very illuminating way to get away, uh, in part anyway, from schoolish uh, 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 assumptions about education and try and understand better what kind of really com complex and deep educational stuff was happening uh, among Bayangola people there. So I thought, all right, what do I know something about? I think so. I thought, yeah, I'll go and find a tailor shop, which I did. And uh, the tailors, there were two or three master tailors and some uh, sort of journeyman style apprentices who were really doing a lot of skilled work. And there were a, a, a two or three little apprentices who were uh, uh, basically, uh, they played, they did a little work around the shop, but nobody uh, pushed them to, to really uh, do serious labor. But they were there all the time and watching and seeing what was going on and so on. So I sat there for most of three weeks, and I only had a day or two left, right? I was going to go back. And I hadn't seen any master tailor teaching an apprentice how to do anything. And I thought, I haven't seen teaching, so what have I come for? What, why, why am I, you know, this is terrible. Uh, what I came to see, I haven't seen. But I also could, <laughs> was somehow thinking about it enough to say, but look, there are master tailors, there are journey people, journeymen, uh, tailors here, uh, they have learned tailoring somehow, and I know they've been learning it in the tailor shop. Something's going on. How come I can't see it happening? And I thought maybe I didn't get up early enough to see the masters holding classes. <laughs> <laughs> this is a really awful story. So, so I go to so. I, one, my, in desperation, I say to one of the master tailors, who was a very kind and nice person, would he teach one of his apprentices? So before I left the country, I could see how the master tailors taught their apprentices. And he said, sure, he, he'd do that. And um, uh, 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 so holding my breath, I went back next to the last day, and he got one of the little apprentices, and he uh, stood over him, basically, and, and said in a loud voice, which you wouldn't have to do if you were talking to the apprentice, right? <coughs> Who was he talking to? He was talking to me, right? So he, I mean, not at me, but it was a performance for my, he was doing me this big favor. He was going to show me how Master Taylor teaches a small apprentice. So he stands over this poor little kid and, and announces some awfully basic things, uh, 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 that, which ended, I, I've gone on too long, which ended up with him saying to the apprentice, and the fly always goes on the front of the trousers. <laughs> 
And at that point, that was disconcerting. That stopped me cold. Because what it said to me was, I had no idea how learning happened in those tailor shops. Clearly, it wasn't through some form of imitation of Western schooling. Uh, uh, it meant that uh, uh, I had no idea what was going on. I had no idea how to describe it, no idea how to go on doing research. And I left the shop, and I remember I just cried all the way back to where I was staying, feeling like, this is impossible. I can't do this. I don't understand. Not only do I not understand, I don't know how to begin to understand what's going on. And um, uh, from there, many years later, came situated learning and some other stuff. But it took years of trying to understand them. But that's what you want to happen to you when you do research. It may be a little painful, you know, at moments. But, but you just want to be blown out of the water by your own ignorance and your own misguided assumptions. Mm -hmm. So maybe I've talked too much. No, no, no. It's, it's fascinating and it's important, I think, because um, if you don't know, run into um, the, that kind of a moment of, of kind of uh, Abyss, but a dark, okay, is that what you mean? Then? Okay, yeah, so it's just the, the feeling of, of being in the dark, because what the, you want to do as a researcher is create um, a new understanding, and you have to uh, you have to create it, which means it's not there yet. Yeah, and I know the grants programs encourages uh, the same in Canada encourages a kind of a, a kind of a rote process a little bit. Yeah. Well, okay, let me ask you then. As you started to piece together a kind of what pro I'm going to say started, would have started as an intuition where you left us off there, yeah. um, a sobbing professor in her uh, hotel room or wherever she is. Okay, you stopped there. But, so an intuition emerges, right? And then um, is there something around the question of, there's, it must have started with, but I know there's relationships. Is that where your intuition started? There, there are relationships amongst people here. What were the early yeah. that you had the departure? Actually, I think that you just had a better intuition than I had at the time. Which, but but I be, I began when I went back uh, uh, for a much longer time uh, I, at the next. Summer, because I was teaching and so on. Um, it was to begin to say, to ask questions, partly in desperation, but I was beginning to say, well, um, these tailors dress um, everybody around them uh, the, the men, women, uh, children, and but different tailors who had different amounts of, the older tailors dressed the dignified older men, and it was the younger tailors who uh, were making trousers and other things for younger people, and apprentices weren't making trousers or uh, adult clothes at all, they were making hats and children's underwear. And, and I thought, okay, there's, at, at least there's some relationship between the, the people and who they are and their relations with others and what they make. And then gradually I began to have other ideas that were about relations uh, uh, of, of um, uh, yeah, among the... Okay, now from there, I want to challenge you with the idea that Okay, you're you're beginning to um, have some thinking. You're 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 arriving at first intuitions, elements of analysis that you now might a path might. And I wish we had the picture of the uh, the ship in the. Oh, oh, do you want? He actually has it. Oh, <laughs> okay. I'll let you say what that is in a second. But a ship in a in a what? The ship. 
What's that thing? What, what this thing is, it's, it's, uh, it has a name. This is um, stone carving by an Inuit stone carver named Pudlo Pudla. You know his work, it's wonderful. Um, uh, and oh, for it has a, it had a name for him, and I, and I, I didn't write it down, and I don't remember. But do you want to? Well, it, it's a ship doing what? We think it's going off into the fog, and the the people and animal, the figures on the ship are all pointed off in that direction, but they can't see very well. It's it's a, it's it's. That's what I understood. And so the idea of inventing analysis, uh, creating the meaning, it means you have to go into the darkness, a fog at the very least, but then, then have some some. Some things you can rely on to navigate and kind of go for it. Okay, but where I want to get to and ask it so we get part of our, 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 our title into this one is this is an early stab. I had an early stab at drawing just some basic dialectic ideas. Anything about dialectics, and I mean in hindsight even, about those early studies that were really leverage points or something in your thinking? Like the, the internal relations. Uh, our, when you say relations, I mean, really, I think of all the... And the philosophy of internal relations. Any, you guys know? If you don't, you have such a treat. You can read Oldman's book, Alienation, and, there, and take away from it many different things, depending on how, how you read it. But the uh, uh, I, situated learning was, uh, I, I think, my... Uh, declaration to myself that hold on. Uh, there were there were things that had been chopped up and separated in our conventional ways of thinking. And you're going to talk? Do no, that's nice. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> or at least it's what I was, I was anticipating you'd say. Oh. So I don't know if that means it's okay. good. Or not. Do I would say that was actually the second point of disconcertment that. Uh, uh, really changed my way of thinking about this stuff. And and it happened because, um, well, I've just complained to you about the invitation of the National Science Foundation to, to, to just do routine research and so on. Part of what I was trying to do with that Liberian research was create, a, 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 I actually made up psychological experiments, it's kind of, Embarrassing. Who me? What do I know? Uh, 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 in which, uh, 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 rather than, which was quite common, uh, psychological research in West Africa in the 70s, that you take tasks made uh, from a school or intelligence tests, and you go off to West Africa and you find. Of, uh, some people who'd had a year or two of schooling, and then you'd have find other people who hadn't been to school at all, who you called uneducated, which might be why I was so angry of, and went off to Liberia <laughs> to do this research in the first place. How dare you call people who hadn't been to school uneducated? Um, you line them up on either side of your mango tree and you give them these same tasks, and lo and behold, the ones who've had a couple of years of schooling do better on these school-like tasks than people who haven't. And um, I felt that, that was, those results were an artifact of what they were engaged in doing experimentally. And so all of my early work on the craft apprenticeship was a way to establishing a basis so I could create experiments um, uh, in which I knew exactly what the tailors knew about, I use math, <laughs> you use, uh, knew about and commonly used quantitative relations, and I knew about ones who'd been to school, and so when I made up uh, these site, these experimental tasks, um, they were not uh, rigged against the tailors, which the, okay. And I, I did those things elaborately. I called ta as tailors, my tailor friends by then. I knew dozens and dozens of tailors. 
um, to I, I rented a little teeny part of a kiosk in the uh, Taylor's Alley, which was a very poor area of Monrovia, where the tailors all gathered, and um, asked them to do these math things I made up. Um, and then I did piles of analysis of them. And you know what? It came out that anybody who kind of had some prior experience and knew uh, how to do uh, sort of work on problems, uh, if you've been to school, the school stuff, if you were a tailor, the tailor stuff, everybody did you know, perfectly fine on the things they knew how to do. And so the result of all of that five years of work was um, the experiments done by the cognitive psychologists going to West Africa were spurious. I was right. Those were artifactual effects. And in fact, um, uh, there was no particular effect of schooling that uh, transcended the effects of just common sense experience in doing stuff, right? But that, so I did that. And I was so, I found that totally boring. <laughs> what is interesting about finding out what you was sure was true before you ever went to do it, um, it turned out the psychologist, never mind, we won't discuss what happened, what the reaction to that research was. I was just bored and I thought, oh, why have I done this? And I woke up one morning, and this is honest to God true, right? I am not making this up. I woke up one morning and said to myself, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll skip the expletives. And I said, oh my goodness, that's what I said. Um, I never saw a tailor in a tailor shop doing work, uh, dealing with relations of quantity in any way that those very same tailors working with what I knew were the same problems because guess what? I made them up for my experiments. I never saw those same tailors working with the same kind of quantitative relations in my little experiments do the same thing in one situation that they had done in the other. And I thought, my God, mathematics is situated activity. Mm -hmm. Ta -da. <laughs> and that was so exciting. I thought, oh, now I understand why it mattered to do that research because the my limited uh, goals for it when I started uh, really were interesting. You know, it was hard work, but it just matters. It's funny that, that, that it sometimes takes a while for new meanings to keep bubbling on, like a, a failed, um, uh, well, not a failed, but I mean, um, the kind of outcomes of all that work of the kind of, of the, the mimicry of the psychological testing to show a basic thing, yeah. but but helped you in the end because it could be recovered once you had kind of broader intuitions and insights. Yeah. So don't throw away your old work. Yeah, yeah, yes, you, you got that. Yeah. Hold on to the because <laughs> it'll it'll keep living and, and adding to your thinking for yeah. sure. That's that's actually one of the things I remember us talking about early on in the morning is, is using. Because I actually used older work recently in a fundamentally new way, and it totally changed my way of thinking. But, um, but you did it too in the case of this, um, the, the, the kind of what you said with common sense. Yeah, people, okay. Um, but, you know, you talk, when you talk disconcertment, you've talked about the notion of uh, cycling back mm. to things and so on. And I wonder if you, is that? what you were thinking about when you were saying you went back to old data and so on? Or do you want to go somewhere else? Uh, no, not necessarily. But on that disconcerting thing, I don't think we have a big disagreement. I was just only going to say that um, something uh, left me with a clear sense uh, that I was missing something. That was my definition of disconcerting. Mm -hmm. I had a gut feeling that even if I had something, uh, there was there was stuff I was definitely needing to do, and I followed a model a little bit, and I, I more than you I think, 
uh, with Holman had this thing uh, where he talks a lot about levels of generality. Yeah, and talk I kept, about that. And so the idea is that um, in the kind of model, a model is a simplified version of, of something, and, uh, and in the simplified version that Holman presents really nicely, and it's based on a reading of, of George Hegel. And he talks about it in terms of not just that scientists are great at taking the world apart, but bringing the world back together again, even when you see that there are different like, levels of, 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 uh, of, uh, of dynamics. So he used the idea of uh, an individual level of generality. That's the stuff that, uh, I'm, for some of you would, would know this, but um, that's the stuff that is, is kind of uniquely you about uh, whatever you're doing. Then the uh, 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 only use, um, Hegel did but the idea of a, a particular level of generality. I know individual particular, but those are the words he used. And it, roughly speaking, about the things that we might share as being uh, uh, members of, uh, say, the professorial, uh, where we both do, we have the same trade. Uh, but you're still very you, and you have a biography, and there are things about you that aren't me. But we're also very similar to each other, and if we go in the right situation, we might be actually be looked at as identical in certain ways, as if, if someone's really only seen us as professors. And then there's a higher level, and, and, and it's just a model, but uh, the woman talks about the universe, and that's not a great word, not a, a word that everybody uses much anymore, but the idea of a very broad shared level of general, what is most general, and I guess we would say just in general, you know, highest level of general, and we talk about us as human beings. Everyday life. Okay, so that's the, this is, did you remember the thing in, in Olmo he talks about the Humpty Dumpty problem? Yes, I love that. What do you love about it? It was, Humpty, it was the, the, the chicken and the egg. Nothing. Well, they both involve eggs. You, 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 you do Humpty Dumpty. I'll do Humpty Dumpty. The idea of this, um, <laughs> oh, just this uh, child, this uh, character in a child, um, what do you call those things, the stories you tell the kids of? And there's this so egg man, smart. and people in my classes, uh, I've used this in my learning theory class. Anyways, uh, the, this egg man falls off the wall, he's broken up, and they can't put Humpty Dumpty together. Again. Well, science, traditional science, is very good at taking Humpty apart and analyzing the pieces. And if, if I were to summarize, there's a, probably a couple ways, I'd like to hear how you would summarize it, dialectics, and, and what it's kind of, in a way, its functions. It's, it's to give you a fighting chance at making the world a whole again in your, in your analysis. Because it's easy to take apart the parts, analyze them, arrive at spurious insights, um, uh, but yeah, things are very interconnected. And he uses this idea of levels of generality, not that things happen in different ways at these different levels of generality, but they're in interaction, not, no, not interaction, they're mutually constituted mm -hmm. and simultaneously yes. real. Yes. Okay. Like that's how strongly Ullman taking Hegel wants to make the case that these things are all having an effect at the same time. Humpty Dumpty needs to be kept together. That's his kind of metaphor there. But anyways, why did I start talking about this? Anybody remember what we were doing? <laughs> it was a two-leg <laughs> story. Two legs. But yeah, that was a good. That was a good comment by me. Uh, the two eggs, because you were talking about the chicken. Oh, the, the other one. Yeah. No. It's oh, an extension, the chicken and the egg. Oh, uh, well, we don't want to turn this into a dialectics lesson, but the idea that um, <coughs> that I was seeking, and here's, here's something that you can compare your story to. I decided that I needed to take in broader and broader levels of generality in the lingo of, of dialectics and moment, anyways. Broader and broader levels of generality. And what I forgot all about was. Um, uh, the, the, the individual biographical human being in all this. And I just wanted to get at what are the nitty gritty details of political economy, what are the nitty gritty details of work design. Now, I'm going to put this over to you. That's just an example, an example of what I thought I was missing, and I was missing in early studies, what I thought I could make better in early, more mid career studies, uh, the main ones I put all my attention into. Um, now, you had an experience. I hope I'm going to characterize this right, but I want to talk about your production school experiences, your studies, and your yeah. evolving insights. What you thought it was, your insights then, and then uh, how it turned into, I'll say it correctly, 
uh, a kind of a, 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 an object of analysis that demanded a theory of hegemony and counter hegemony. I, I don't want to. Yeah. Um, uh, maybe I, I would just say before that about dialectics the, uh, and, and how to think and, and work dialectically that for me what uh, th that notion you're talking about about uh, levels that operate always together they never they are mutually constitutive and and they are always all in operation in, in somewhere another uh, another way to say the same thing no we're running out of time I can't believe it we've only begun <laughs> oh okay that's I was looking at your chair you're gone okay. <laughs> you want to go get a sandwich okay <laughs> Okay, yeah, so we... All right, we'll be really quick. For, for me, uh, the philosophy of internal relations says that every things are their relations. And that's one of the initial, in the Omen's alienation, that's, he begins with that idea, and it seemed incredibly important to me that uh, uh, if, if things are their relations, then uh, the things that, that, that's a radical argument against a kind of dualist and the kind of thinking by which we say there are, there are individuals in society. There's the mind and the body. There is, uh, you know, we operate with those all over the place. And the notion that things are the, well, and what that says is, um, if uh, I establish that there's some kind of relation between the mind and the body, like maybe they go together, there's something about them, that uh, there's a person who just has a mind and a body, and so um, uh, 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 that if I, uh, in the kind of conventional ways that we think, which he calls the philosophy of of external relations. If something happens to one of, uh, the, we take the relation away, it doesn't change either one of the objects. So that it doesn't, that, that's an argument you couldn't make if you believe in situated learning. It says you, uh, so here's a person and a problem, uh, uh, and, and if you take away the, the relations of which are of which they are a part when they're working a problem in one setting. If you take those away, neither the person nor the problem is the same. Uh, even if the same person and the same problem move to a different setting. So what Olman was doing was challenging us all, I think, to uh, see everything as a made of relations such that. Uh, you can't uh, talk about uh, uh, the social world and people uh, as somehow uh, you can address them in many different, as objects. Uh, uh, and you can, if you take away even the simple relations you think exist between them, they, in fact, are transformed you know, through a philosophy of internal relations. This is terrible. <laughs> well, no, it's not bad. And, and we're going to go to a question and answer. But I would, you, can give, you can even do a yes or no on this one. See, that was, that's, see I would have contended that you, you created a homemade, uh, beginning from an empirical experience, like a type of you know, personal but scientific commitment. Um, as your guide to theorizing, not beginning with the theory. A little bit, I did a little more than that than you did. A little yeah. bit more of the theory. And you said, what the heck's going on? I'm going to leave this trip without having any analysis um, in your first trip with the tailors. But I think you, 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 you handmade, a homemade, handmade, a, a kind of a, a dialectic, uh, a, a theory of learning as dialectics, without, without necessarily knowing all the details. And that's actually how most great researchers and, and, and do things. All your original research is going to do a version of this, I think. 
You've had right. students like this. And Absolutely. I see the magic spark go off. Uh, it, you should have the last word that Michael can come in, but that was just an, an insight I thought, and that was a really well, well described, I thought, of the relationship between having a, an internal relation-centered model of learning and its implications. Yeah. Um, which, yeah, and yeah. Well, that's a great way to stop, I think. Oh. <laughs> um, Okay. Well, we'll get answer, questions and answers. And if someone asks about the production schools, if you okay. I'm, I'm glad to talk about the production schools. Well, first off, thank you very much for the first part of the conversation. I would argue and suggest we do not stop. We widen the circle and invite you to partake in the conversation. And I think that's really why we wanted to have that time for questions, for comments, um, and so that is not a stopping, it is what you really model, that dialogical way of coming to answers, but sometimes more importantly, even phrasing the right questions. So with that in mind, what I will do is I look for your signal, and then I come with a microphone, and then you can ask a question. <laughs> so one, two, okay. wonderful, okay. Thank you, Jean and Peter, and this is Gesu, and it was great um, to listen to your fresh conversation um, today. And my question is actually an extension of what Jean was talking about, like the internal relations and that things are their relations. And you mentioned in your in the beginning of the conversation that we as researchers need to have long-term questions, like key questions that drive us. And I want to ask both of you, what were your long-run questions that still drive you? And I want you to explain it in terms of dialectically. What are the relations that shape that long-run question? <laughs> okay. All right, I'll do it. Then you got to do it, too. <laughs> Look, I, if you think of learning now, I now think of learning as as the as a part of and itself only a partial way of understanding of a, a, a relation of change. Learning is a relation of change, and it is change uh, of persons participating in ongoing everyday practice and all of that is made in of the historical political relations of which our world uh, in which our world exists that's a dialectical uh, 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 based on a, a long dialectical analysis of, of, uh, of uh, how our system of, of the of the world as historical political relations and then what it would mean to talk about learning as a part of a partial relation um, um, of, in ongoing practice and and once you do that you uh, begin to think of things like um, uh, okay let's see what is that historical political world we live in let's call it uh, capitalism. And then let's talk about hegemony as the way in which capitalism is trying to reproduce itself, struggling to reproduce itself. And, uh, and, and uh, then things like uh, the kind of uh, learning going on uh, or the practices of learning in the those production schools in Denmark, I've been trying to understand better all this time, are you understand them and understand learning them as part of a counter hegemonic project to, to try to make different kinds of relations of which learning is a part? Let's talk social change, uh, 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 social Justice, the transformation of the world, in and and uh, ultimately revolution, 
of, and, the, and revolution of Lefebvre's terms of everyday life. That's where you get to, I think, you start thinking of learning as part of processes. If you say, what do I want out of this? I think what we, how we conceptualize learning needs to be part of processes of supporting social change of, of democratic and from below kinds in open-ended ways that I don't know where they would end up. That's why I do what I do. <laughs> Let's take another question. Yes, we have the next question queued up. <laughs> He's cheating. <laughs> Ask Peter the next question. Um, I might sound like I'm cheating, actually, because kind of the end of your answer segues really beautifully into, I think, where my question is coming from. And my question, and it's still forming, so I don't have it fully articulated, but it's something around how do you reconcile, what are your thoughts on reconciling the tension between for change to happen at a so-called systemic level, um, we need evidence that those moments of resistance those moments of reconceptualizing learning in the ways that you've just described, we need evidence of that happening because that sort of builds perhaps a narrative of hope um, which will then influence systemic level changes is, is one mental model that seems to be prevalent right now. So how can that be reconciled with recognizing that this can perhaps remain limited to a moment between a few people and it still meant something to them and it still transformed them in some way? How, what, what's the, yeah, just your thoughts about that. I could start as well. Um, I think it's really important to document the, uh, the seen but unnoticed um, uh, positive developmental changes and opportunities in order to reproduce them. And especially, uh, well, Jean's fond of saying everyday life is life. That's, that's all there is, and uh, yeah, I tend to agree. So I think documenting the way people are transforming themselves, uh, and uh, sometimes even just uh, the kind of very local, maybe even just the household community around them, documenting that is really important to reproduce it, and you find yourself challenging, I, would, I think I would say, I think you find yourself challenging uh, very um, well-established, uh, uh, even theories of learning when you do that, because uh, learning has a basic under um, under articulated goal, and it's a little bit like that new term, um, the healthy cow. Uh, the idea that um, uh, we need to do what we can to keep uh, how, how would you put it? to keep stasis. That's the conventional. And it's actually, if you look close enough at learning, do you find that most of the ways we talk about learning, uh, things like knowledge and schooling, certainly, um, uh, tend to reinforce this stuff. There's something really radical in looking at the way people are solving uh, local problems. Uh, Marcel happens to be writing my sight line here when I'm talking to you, and he's kind of a master at looking at local solutions to large uh, political yeah. problems, political economic yeah. problems. And, uh, but I would say every level of generality counts in those uh, discussions. Uh, individuals, I used to be quite biased against studying individual transformations. Okay, uh, I, I'm into the, you know, I, I want to see large social change. Yeah. And, and I think of true, uh, to use the terminology we're using here, the philosophy of internal relations, uh, there can be no level of generality left behind if you're going to make change. That's a very nice. That's like a roof off the new left behind. Did you get that? No, I didn't. <laughs> Did you get that? <laughs> Anyways, and so I think there's value in documenting uh, what seem like mundane changes. Uh, if you if you can fix your lens in such a way to note that it's actually a counter hegemonic, even if it's mundanely so, because mm -hmm. all those are pieces to the puzzle. No change. Will my my contention: no change will happen unless some of those mundane changes of of healthy lives. Doesn't sound even super radical, but it's very important. There's no change in society without healthy lives. I know I'm not the best example of that in other ways. This is, more <laughs> this is a lot of fun. Thank you. This is this is excellent. Um, I want to go back to what you initially the uh, the contention between you both, so so to speak, uh, in mind, your mind, 
and gene practice. Um, and maybe you can comment on that. Um, if you were a post-structuralist, maybe, you would say subjectivity, perhaps. I'm, I'm just putting it out there. And maybe consciousness, and how does mind practice compare and contrast with subjectivity, consciousness, and Okay, I'm just putting, I'm just yeah. making a mix there. I think we got I, I got a, I got a great idea. Let's try this. Why don't you say, why don't you argue my side of it? Say, this is what I think Peter's arguing. <laughs> so this is, this is, it's not just a recorder, it, just, and I'll do yours, I'll make the argument, and then you can correct me on, on you, I didn't do a good you, and I'll say how you're not doing a good me. How about that? That's, I just invented it. Let's try Okay, try it. All right. So why, what would, what would I say about why I use the term mind? I think you, uh, okay, that what I was about to say was, wasn't you doing it, it's me saying, I suspect that what he was, <laughs> Can I get away with that? Uh, that what he was, I think he was coming off of a Soviet activity theory uh, approach to uh, 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 activity, to learning as a part of, uh, not really learning, but activity theory. And in activity theory, uh, uh, I think of some of Vygotsky's work probably, uh, uh, was a, 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 about the, maybe there was some contextual stuff about, you know, there was science and there was every, uh, everyday stuff and schooling would help you bring them together in your mind and, and so on. Uh, well, let me say my side. I'm not sure. Yeah. I, um, I actually, you I don't know why you did that. I know. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I know. Because we've had this conversation yeah. five times. Yeah. And, Go for it. Uh, but uh, no, I would say, I'll, I'll just uh, say what I think the argument is for a, a theory of practice and maybe relations. Because I, I yeah. put it up there. Maybe that's too stark. But mine, uh, you know, kind of a, a center, centering on the idea of mind versus centering on practice. I think. The, the strong argument, the steel man argument about the practicing is you really can avoid, and to the degree to the degree with your question here too, you can avoid some of the real hegemonic bear traps by staying away from internalized centers of learning and development theory. That's what I, I'm trying to think how you would argue to me why I shouldn't use the word mind. Right. Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, you did that very well. I, so. <laughs> well, I read a lot of your work, uh, but um, but the mind thing. No, the mind thing. I'll tell you. There's because I thought about this over the time, and I think there is a bear trap in there. That's a problem. But I also think that mind is such such a helpful word because it's so poorly defined, and it's a floating signifier in which I can argue and people in my classes. Shout out to advanced studies and workplace learning class people and the practitioners, uh -huh. Marcel's practitioners Hi. class students, because uh, they were all coming here as part of the, this is a course this week. Um, uh, um, the, just, the, there's a real bear trap, but it's, it's, I use this in my course, the idea that what is mine and does it, does it have anything to do with an individual and under what conditions could, do we have to think of mind as a larger collective thing? And then, so I think it's handy as a pedagogical device. It's also in keeping, this is where you started with, it's in keeping with my kind of community of, of my professional scholarly community is, I don't really fit super well with them, but it's the activity of the community of And other than that, I worry about the bear trap of, yeah. uh, of the internalization. I guess you could, if you took your notions about uh, what's in Ullman about the different levels of generality, the, and you say the concept of mind is vague, maybe it's vague precisely in a, a being something you can apply to uh, at many levels of generality if you wanted to. That's the were, goal. If you yeah. really wanted to do that, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have to prove it, but there's a question. Somebody's really yeah. motivated by it. Thank you. I, sorry. Hi, um, I'm Amy Ainsley, I'm a, a PhD candidate uh, here at Boise. And um, I'm so glad that you're, that you're here visiting. Um, at, the, at the end of uh, Situated Learning, you talk about how um, newcomers and old timers are kind of stuck in this dilemma where you know, the newcomers are, are changing the community of practice as they're joining it. 
and there's this tension there. And it's actually something that I give my placement students to read as they reflect on what kind of practitioner they want to be. And um, I guess I've sort of struggled finding who has carried that thread forward, either empirically or theoretically, and thought a bit about what it's like to be changing a practice when there is that power imbalance as a newcomer. And I wonder if you have thoughts on that. It's clearly a teammate question. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, there are people who have picked up that idea. I, I think in a slightly more general form, we meant that as a uh, um, as a way to with our unfortunate idea of community of practice, which has turned out to be very useful in a bunch of different ways, but also extremely easy to misconstrue as a, a, a nice homogeneous group of people with a shared purpose engaging in an activity together. No, that is not why we introduced that concept of community of practice. It was to say, it was a question the community of practice is, a, is an analytic question. And the question it is, is given that the world is heterogeneous, given that people involved in doing something uh, in relation with each other bring different things to it, have different interests in it, and in particular, given that we're, we, we're still dealing with a kind of schoolish idea of what learning was for, uh, uh, we were trying to call attention to the fact that people who were deeply invested in some practice, some uh, corporate uh, office or a, a, a running, uh, running a university program or whatever, um, that they had stakes in it uh, continuing to be like it is or develop in according to their vision and people who don't have those states yet who are sort of newcomers of various kinds uh, uh, are e can either be careless <laughs> with uh, the uh, old timers uh, desires and practices or or in fact of course they have different ideas they come at different times or different places and those tensions configure our practices all the time, everywhere. We all are involved in, in, in being able to recognize those tensions as just, try family life um, uh, uh, if you don't think that those tensions, the kinds of relations are, are, are important. Um, what did you want to know about them? I guess just if there were either theoretical or empirical works that I, I just had trouble sort of finding things that were clearly citing that part of the book and kind of carrying that forward. In well, my you know, uh, Etienne Menger, who was my student, um, when he finished his PhD, he, for various reasons, couldn't take an academic job. And he came to me and said, could he have communities of practice as a, a something that he could uh, form a consulting business around. To which I said, of course, he needed to make a living. Who, he, we written the thing together. Uh, and I think he, that consulting business uh, was a consulting business for management, business schools, management, groups in corporations and so on. And the pressures to uh, interpret uh, uh, the, the, what it meant to talk about a community of practice in the ways that I was just critical of uh, uh, were, were very strong and it made it very hard to uh, take uh, the, the, the real point, which is how does anybody learn anything when we're all different and engaged in different ways in doing something? That's an interesting question. But communities of practice, was it? P people sometimes say, do I found something? Is it a community of practice? To which, but there is no such 
in, in the world. There are no uh, objects out there that we're now discovering, which are communities of practice. What that always was, was intended as a question. A question about the, the uh, uh, people engaging together and changing in practice, given that they're very different from each other. Um, now, we did start a bit later, but I'm still tasked with keeping an overall um, eye on time. So what I would suggest, I have three more expressions of interest for questions. I would suggest to bundle them, and then you can hear what comes from the question, then you can see where you take it. So I'll give it to you, you and then I saw you. Yes. And mine is maybe just an echo of what uh, Marcel was asking. It's just, I was uh, interested to know how you would both discuss or share your thoughts on uh, taking a few concepts together, like practice, consciousness, and language, and then positioning those in relation to learning. And I just wondered if that could be a little bit... Uh, yeah, I, I yeah. forgot. To, you do it. I, I will, but we're going to take all three. Okay. I'm going to try to remember that one, which is a really easy one. <laughs> I think I think mine is also could be a simple question, but I'm trying to conceptualize this learning as a form of relations. So when I first hear your example, I'm thinking learning as a relations with other people uh, with respect to activity or certain activity. But how does how does one conceptualize the relationship dynamics between an individual subjects with the broader system elements such as water productions? Use an exchange, use value and exchange value, using Marx's term. How does that in, it influence relationship level between subjects when it comes to determining an activity, importance of an tells of an activity? Right. So that's I wanted to get your perspective on relationship at a system level. Thank you. Um, oh, we're gonna have fun with these questions. Um, yeah. uh, <laughs> so I just wanted to thank everybody that's made this event possible, especially to both of you for being here and sharing your knowledge with us. Uh, my name is Taha, I'm a master's student here, and something that you mentioned, uh, Jean, was learning is a relation of change. Um, and that's something I've been thinking about a lot recently, especially since I said it a few minutes ago. <laughs> and I'm just wondering, you know, we, like I grew up under a dictatorship, and then I saw that people were really upset with the army, and then the dictatorship gets toppled, and then people, there's a, sort of ushering in of a democratic government, which is corrupt, and then people harken back to the times of dictatorship, and there's that short-term memory loss within all of that change. I don't know if it's like a trauma response from generation to generation, and I'm just wondering, how can we make sure that, as you said, learning is a relation of change, that learning is sustainable for the long term? Um, it's not possible? Okay. Oh, well, uh, oh, okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Do you want, uh, I'll start with Ashraf here. Um, I think that Jean and I, the, 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 there's that phrase like devils in the details. I think, in a way, the difference between Jean and I would probably come out in an interesting way in terms of our practical response to uh, students about how you, how you begin to take on questions of language, say, and use of language, Consciousness, Consciousness and practice in relation to learning. Yeah, and I, I like people uh, to think about it in the traditional, um, uh, I start with um, some of the, the basic frameworks from the Vygotsky tradition, uh, which, um, for instance, in terms of language, firstly, to think about it in its most simple way as a tool and how people are using it and not how they think they're using it. Um, uh, but try to see it in action. Um, now, that's, there are real limits to that because uh, language is, is a, a, a master tool. Like it's a very dense tool. So that has to, that simple way of starting is a way of starting and then seeing the difference that the use of language makes, especially on a biographical, emotional level language. I, I tried out this thing, um, how people use language. Uh, I, I use the term, uh, uh, I think made it up, uh, not the words, but uh, ma a mantra artifacts. Mantras are things that people, um, we can find them all the time in our own lives, that we have things, whether we're paying attention or not, that we repeat, that allow to mediate our action through, say, a difficulty. You know, like, I'll say, uh, one of mine is not unusual, I'll say, 
uh, be present. I said it just before today because I like having a plan and not just doing a free-for-all conversation. So I was very anxious and I said, just be present, something will happen. So it's a little mock. You can see that there's emotional, there's cognition, all in that. And it's also a tool that I'm using to mediate our relationship with all of you and, and Jean and Michael and it's so like uh, Consciousness is a more challenging one, but I would start simple and, and think in terms of um, unself-consciousness, which dominates most of our uh, actions and practices, I would say. And uh, there's different ways of going about that. I, Jean goes about what I think would be different. And I, but I would start simple ways to get those things, to be able to get your fingers on these things in empirical context. Yeah, so you should sure. start doing something. We surely agree on that. I'll stop there on that one. Um, Jay's question feels a little bit more like a question about maybe a little bit about levels of generality, actually. I, I might yeah, you, I, you know, I actually, I think we're all... We talked to Jay today, really. He's Jay, right here. There. The first okay. and then the last question is a hard one too. Okay. And that's for you. We were talking, yes. Yeah. Um, look, we didn't we had um, th there's a third theme up there called I think subjectivity, right? And we didn't get to it. But um, uh, I would I would I, I think we probably agree that we do agree that over a whole lot of our, our, our working work lives, we have av avoided uh, a a a theorizing or, or really trying to talk about the subject or subjectivity. Why? Because uh, Peter calls it the bear trap. It's, it's uh, you know, uh, I, I was going on at lunchtime, there is no such thing as an individual. And we talk about people as if they were individuals all the time. You can talk about consciousness in an individual in a, 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 a less and more comfortable way than I can talk about consciousness in the kind of uh, theory of the subject I've got, um, which says, that I, 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 just for example, try Gramsci's notion of not the subject, but the person. And if you're going to talk about all of these aspects of the human world as historic, they are historical political relations, um, there are subjects, there are persons who are made of, in, and are part of the world. And when you, I, I read, this is an argument for this empirical way of approaching things. I read Gramsci for years, and I could never figure out why he defined the person and persons the way he did. Persons, he says, are the ensemble of social relations. What in heaven's name is that? And um, it was only in working on the uh, uh, production school stuff that I began to get a sense of what that might mean, that, that is that um, uh, a, a person's, a person's learning uh, are not, uh, supposing you're a, a young person in a production school workshop in Copenhagen, and uh, you are working, you're learning that work as you're doing it, you're uh, how that happens is in the whole collection of other people and who are engaged in the same work and with all of the re uh, tools, relations, stuff going on uh, that make it possible for a, a person who defined as a collection of social relations it to uh, change, or uh, that they are engaged in change. If you do that, it, it makes problematic and, and difficult the idea of a theory of consciousness, and, and, uh, and to which I have no answers and have no idea what to do. And, and they're a unique constellation of, uh, of ensemble relations. At the individual level, you're, you're, you're utterly unique. 
uh, you are a once in a lifetime entity that will come uh, only once in the exact ensemble, especially when we take into account the biography. I want to address this to your question, though. And I got so troubled at trying to answer these questions. Could you just sum it up again? The last question of the three? I was just kind of asking how is, if learning is a relation of change, how do you ensure that that learning is sustainable long term, that people don't forget it? Uh, why would you want to? That is, I think what you do is an analysis of uh, look, change is a term that if you say the world is, uh, is, is change, changing, learning is a relation of change. That's not good or bad in itself, for sure. Uh, it's da very dangerous to think change is a, a wonderful thing that ought to be going on, or it's terrible and it shouldn't. That requires analysis of every kind of, of what, of what historical political relations you're talking about. It sure seems like this, the, that was a very neat analysis of a whole lot of transformative change and, and, and that led you to ask about learning. I think I'd start there, take that, and say, uh, learning of what, how, by whom, under what circumstances, where does forgetting uh, become a political economic advantage of the rich and powerful imposed on others? Uh, uh, where, uh, you know, um, and when I was working on those issues, I've come to think over the long run that you might want uh, that, that the learning as a relation of change is a really subversive idea. And if you treat it as the founding place you want to start to do an analysis of how to bring about a changing everyday world, I wouldn't start with education. I would start with learning as the analytic concept because it is, um, <coughs> like Cornell West says, there's nothing more threatening than democracy from below. Uh, well, maybe that's a really good um, segue into the next phase of the conversation. Uh, first, I would really like to extend a big, big thank you to Jean and Peter to end this conversation, we take it from below to the next level, and to level 12. Yeah. Ah. And we talk about the nexus of adult learning, or adult learning is the nexus of life, course, work, and physician. Now, we will be in the nexus bar, so um, the loud, is it the bar too? I'm not, okay, I'm not licensed. Um, so those of you who do not know, there is a reception, uh, some food, I suppose, some drinks at the nexus lounge to which you are all invited in the 12th. Floor. Thank you all for your participation. Thank you for the questions that helped really bring to light those complex issues. And again, thank you for really. Thank you. Thank you. This has been another episode of Work Learning and Social Change Foundational Voices. Please consider exploring our other episodes and series. And if you like what you find, why not consider subscribing or following us on YouTube or Spotify so that you don't miss a thing.